Hey, welcome back to Clinical Optics Made Easy, Fun with Lenses. I'm your narrator, M.N. Wiggins, and let's jump right in. And on today's agenda, we're going to be discussing everything you see here with special attention to the Donut Burger. Once again, thank you to Davis Street Publishing for having me in their wonderful studios today. As you can see, uh, this is where all of my talk comes from, the Clinical Optics Made Easy book. You can read whatever you want to in optics, but please, please work lots and lots of problems. If you're interested in this particular reference, you can uh, scan the QR code or go directly to davisstreet.com. Either way, it'll get you there. So what makes a lens? Well, number one, a lens has to be transparent and a lens has to have curvature and there has to be a difference in the refractive index of the media and what surrounds it. So let's look at a formula for how strong of a refractive surface a lens can be. And so you can see here that the diopters are equal to the difference in the refractive index of the two media divided by the radius of curvature in meters. So let's put some numbers to this thing. What's the refracting power of a cornea with a radius of curvature as shown here? So we put everything into that formula and you can see that we come out with a value of 45 diopters, which sounds a heck of a lot like a K reading as it should. Here's the question for you though. What happens if this guy jumps in a swimming pool? So as you can see here, the refractive index of the cornea does not change, but instead of being in air, he's now in water and there's not a whole lot of difference between those two refractive indices and his K reading drops from 45 down to one. So his cornea effectively, optically, becomes very flat. So he becomes more hyperopic. And that really explains why it's very hard to see under water. However, it is theoretically possible that if you are a higher myope, you might actually see better underwater. Now here's a figure on the radius of curvature in case you're not sure what that means. So what you do is you take a tennis ball or a racquetball, you cut it in half, you think about the exact center point, and then you draw a line to the inner wall, and that is what radius of curvature means. So what would happen to the K reading if I made the radius of curvature a little bit longer, not a whole lot? What do you think is going to happen here? Look at these choices. Well, let's find out. So let's take a look over here on the left. We have our calculations from before where we have our 45 diopters, but over here on the right, we've changed the radius of curvature from 0.0075 to 0.0085. And you can see the effect on the K reading. It became flatter. And that should make sense to you. If you were, let's say, walking along a bowling ball, it would be fairly steep. But if you had something with a much larger radius of curvature like the earth, it would be much flatter. Did you notice that sometimes when we're talking about the radius of curvature of the cornea in these lectures, we're using 1.3375 and other times we'll use 1.37. That's because 1.3375 is a fudge factor built in to all manual keratometers. The actual refractive indice of the cornea is 1.37. Now, why a fudge factor? That's because manual keratometers are only measuring the front surface of the cornea. The cornea has a back surface, which is a small minus lens. Let's redo this looking at the front and back side of a cornea. So here we go on the left, you see the front side, but instead of using the fudge factor, we're gonna use the actual refractive index of the cornea. And instead of 45 diopters, we get 49.3. But we also have to account for the back side but here, instead of the refractive index of a cornea versus air, it's cornea versus aqueous, and we get a minus 5.3. Add those two together, and you get a sum of 44 diopters, which is very close to the 45 diopters we got using the keratometer fudge factor, invented by our ophthalmology ancestors who were quite ingenious. Here's why you care. The relationship between the front of the cornea and the back of the cornea is relatively constant and that was used in the fudge factor development. However, when you do any sort of refractive surgery, be it RK, LASIK, LASIK, PRK, any of those variants, you are changing the relationship between the front of the cornea and the back of the cornea. 
and therefore your K readings are suspect and could cause an error in your IOL calc selection. So make sure that you consider using some of those compensation formulas that are online. So now we're going to talk about the effectiveness of effectivity. So here we have clearly a hyperopic eye because the far points back behind the eye. And as you know, that is corrected with a plus lens such that the focal point of the plus lens falls on the far point of the hyperopic eye. But what if the position of that lens were to change? Looking at the top diagram, the lens is sitting in the perfect spot. It's adding convergence. It's bringing that focal point from behind the eye up to the retina. But if we move that lens just a little bit closer to the eye, the focal point will move in the same direction and now be back behind the eye again. The distance from the lens to the cornea is called the vertex distance, and that distance matters. And here's the question. I've got a plus two lens and I have this vertex distance of 12 millimeters, and I'm going to move it away from the eye so that that distance becomes 14 millimeters. What lens power adjustment is needed? So once again, here is a hyperopic eye. There is the far point. The first lens right below it is the correcting lens because that focal point lands right there. But if I take that same lens and I move it a little farther away from the eye, as you can see, that focal point is going to move in whatever direction I move that lens. And so now it is the wrong power. So now I need something that doesn't converge quite as much to cover that new distance. So here's how you work it. I'm going to take that 12 millimeter vertex distance and I'm going to increase it to 14 millimeters because I'm moving the lens again away from the eye. And so that's a 0.2 centimeter difference. So I had a plus two lens, which 100 divided by 50 is plus two. But now I'm not 50 centimeters for my focal length. Now I'm 50.2 centimeters. So 100 divided by 50.2 becomes plus 1.99. What if I had a plus two lens with a vertex distance of 1.3 centimeters and I'm gonna move it closer to the eye. I'm gonna reduce that vertex distance. So now I'm 0.3 centimeters closer to the far point. So my plus two focal length of 50 centimeters, I now have a focal length 0.3 centimeters closer, so only 49.7. You can see that difference is plus two becomes plus 2.01. Now, I know what you're thinking. Big freaking deal. Well, here's where it does matter. This time, I have a plus 10 lens, vertex distance of 13, moving it into 10. And what am I gonna uh, do to adjust that power to account for that difference in the vertex distance? 10 centimeters becomes 9.7. And now we've gone from a plus 10 lens to needing a plus 10.3. So before we had a two versus 1.99 or versus 2.01, they don't make a plus 1.99 or two plus uh, 0.01. They do make a 10 versus a 10.25. So we're getting into some clinical significance here. Now suppose I had that 10 diopter lens and I'm going to change the vertex distance from 10 out to 14, so away from the eye. So I'm going to add 0.4 centimeters to that focal length and now I've gone from needing a plus 10 to a plus 9.62. So again, when we get to these higher powers, we're getting into some clinical relevance here. So here's the take home. Oftentimes when you're manifesting someone with a foropter, they will tend to lean back a little bit from the foropter. Their head won't be all the way up against it like it's supposed to be. And the person refracting, if that's you or your technician, won't notice it because they're hidden behind the foropter. It's hard to tell. But what measurement you take with the foropter is based upon whether or not they're completely up against it or leaning back a little bit because those are vertex distance changes. So you may think that they're fully up against that uh, foropter and you're measuring with a vertex distance of say 12, but you might actually be measuring them at a vertex distance of 15. And what you've just learned from lens effectivity is that that changes the power that you're finding on your manifest refraction. So you may actually prescribe them the wrong prescription 
uh, because the vertex distance is not what you thought it was. And so then they're going to be unhappy with that. They're going to go try and buy these $400 glasses, and it's not quite going to be as good as it was in your office. So here's the recommendation. This becomes a bigger problem as the dioptric power that you're prescribing gets larger. So when you're prescribing anything that's over plus or minus six, you should really do it in a pair of trial frames, which you will likely never do because no one hardly ever does. Everyone wants to use the four opter because it's convenient. That's why we have them. So you can at least do this. When you're prescribing a big number, put them into a pair of trial frames at the end after you've found the prescription, put them on the patient, and let them look around a little bit. Maybe step out of your lane, look up and down the hall, the exit sign, something like this, and just double check that things are correct before you write that script. So before we leave this all together, let's do a minus lens. Here we've got a minus 10 and we've got a vertex distance of 13. We're going to move it closer to the cornea by 10. What adjustment do we need to do? So a difference of 0 0.3 and our 10 centimeters becomes 10.3 centimeters as we get closer to the cornea. Wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. It should be the opposite, right? No. It's the distance from the far point that matters. So think about that for a moment. When we were doing the plus lenses, we were talking about hyperopes with the far point back behind the eye. So as we got closer to the cornea, we had to subtract because we were getting closer to the far point. We needed a shorter focal length. But in a myope, the far point is between the eye and infinity. So it's out in front of the eye. So if we move that pair of glasses closer to the cornea, we're actually getting farther away from their far point, which is out in front of them. So we have to add that distance. And this is commonly a source of error uh, when you're asked this type of question on an exam. So here's what I recommend. Sketch these out. Draw where that lens is relative to the eye, where the far point is, and then where the new lens is relative to the far point. And then it becomes easy to see whether we're going to add or we're going to subtract. And you can see here once again that with a power of 10, it is a clinically significant change in what we're going to prescribe. Behold the donut burger. I was in Orlando and found this on a menu, and I, I can't even describe how good this thing was. I mean, you can see the quality of the hamburger and the lettuce on there, and once again, I have no idea what that sauce is around those uh, sweet potato tater tots. It was just spectacular. Don't worry about it. What's behind that question mark? Not important, but the donut burger. Oh. Here's a question that you may or may not get on an exam, but it is a high yield clinical thing because you will see this. So if a patient tells you that they need to slide their glasses down their nose to read, what are we going to do about that? And you might think that it has to do with whether or not they're a hyperope or a myope, but actually it doesn't. Remember that whenever we move a lens, that focal point will move in the same direction we move the lens, whether it's plus or whether it's minus, does not matter. So if she's telling you that she has to move her lens down her nose or away from her eye to see better, she's telling you that her focal point is starting out somewhere behind the eye, and by moving her lens down her nose, she's bringing it forward onto her retina. That's the same thing as adding converging power. So that's what you need to do so that she doesn't have to slide her glasses. So increase her bifocal add. Okay, moving on. We now have a question that says there's a lens system that has an object 20 centimeters to the left of a plus 10 lens, which is 40 centimeters to the left. Wait, wait, hold up. We have two lenses in our system now? How in the world do we do that? It wants to know where the final image is located, orientation. How do we know real versus virtual? Well, the classic teaching is a real image can be projected onto a surface like a movie screen and a virtual in image can't. And that's never really helped me. Uh, maybe it helps you. But the thing that I understand is that a real image V in U plus D equal V is going to be positive. And if it's negative, that's a virtual image. So I do understand plus and minus V. When you're given these two lens system questions, by far, the easiest thing to do is to sketch it out. 
just like those lens effectivity questions. If you can see it, it makes a heck of a lot more sense. At least it does to me. So here's what it's told us so far. There's an object 20 centimeters to the left of a plus 10 lens, and that lens is 40 centimeters left of this plus 20 lens. And so the, here's what we know. Here is the key to working two lens system problems. We're gonna use U plus D equal V like we always have, and then we're going to use it again for the other lens. So whatever uh, we do on the left-hand side, we're gonna to start to ignore and then just work on. Let me say that another way. The object that you see here is gonna be the U, and then the plus 10 is gonna be our D, and whatever we get for our image, that is gonna become the U for the next half of the problem. And then the D for the next half of the problem is gonna be the plus 20. And when we're working that part of it, we're gonna ignore all that plus 10 stuff that came before. All we wanna know is where that first image is because that becomes the object that's gonna create the final image. So here we go. So we know that uh, the object is 20 centimeters left of that first lens, so U must be a minus five. And then we were given the D, and so we can calculate that V is plus five, so we know the location of the first image, also called the intermediate image, is gonna be 100 divided by five. So we add that to our sketch. So here it is. And if it is 20 centimeters to the right of that plus 10 lens, and it's 40 centimeters from one lens to the other, it therefore must be 20 centimeters to the left of your plus 20 lens. Now I can do U plus D equal V again. And once again, U is minus five because that's the distance from my intermediate image to my plus 20. And then I've got plus 20 and I can calculate that V is a plus 15 diopters and I divide 100 by 15 and I get 6.7 centimeters. So now I can see, I add it to my diagram here, where that image is going to be. So now I have an intermediate image in the green. I have a final image in that, uh, I don't know what color that is. Is that magenta? It's the, the thing that's somewhere between red and purple, that arrow there. So the question originally asked us, where is the final image located? Well, we figured out 6.7 centimeters to the right of the second lens. That was not bad. What is its orientation and is it real or virtual? Well, let's start with the real or virtual thing. V was plus 15 and when V is positive, it's real. So that's not bad. Uh, what was the magnification? It, it didn't ask us magnification. It looks like I threw that in anyway. And that's U over V, and so we get 0 0.33. So we know that the final image is smaller than the intermediate image, which is the object forming that final image. Now, here's the kicker. To determine the orientation, we know that when U over V is positive, the image is going to be upright, and when U over V is negative, it's going to be inverted. Why is the image upright? Because we had a minus five was our U for that second half of this thing, and plus 15 is our V. So that's minus U over V. Why is it not inverted? And the answer is the U, the intermediate image, which is now the object, it started out inverted. And so if you're minus U over V, it's gonna be flipped from wherever it started. So because the intermediate image was upside down, the final image has to be right side up because U over V is minus. So that's a little bit tricky, um, but I think you're getting it. Now, what if they ask you this same problem, but they don't give you any numbers? Then you can do the central ray thing that we've done before. And in fact, if they're just giving you numbers and you've sketched it out, you can also do the central ray and check your math. And then that the flipped of the already flipped kind of thing, that will show itself to you and it won't be confusing at that point. But let's back up and just say that they didn't give us any numbers to begin with. And here we have this lens system and it's got this upright object and it's to the left. I mean, you can read it here. And then it wants to know magnification and orientation of all the images. So this one you're forced to sketch out, or if it's showing you point A and point B, it probably already sketched it out for you. 
So here we go, a lens system with an upright object to the left of a plus lens, which is to the left of another plus lens, and it's giving you location A and B. So let's draw some lines here. And I just threw in some powers of the lenses just for fun. Obviously, they didn't give us that, but it wouldn't matter for your central ray anyway. You're going to draw it the same way. So we can see that because the object and the image are on opposite sides over here on the left-hand side around this plus 10, the intermediate image is going to be upside down. And then we can kind of eyeball it to tell that it's just a little bit bigger than the object. So there is some magnification going on there. Now we're going to draw another central ray using our intermediate image as the object for the second half, this right-hand half of the system. And as you see here, the image that it forms is indeed upright, like our math told us, and it's smaller than the, uh, the intermediate image. So central rays are very, very handy. So for the final subject of our talk today, we're going to go through pantoscopic tilt. And this is a clinically relevant thing that you will see. Pantoscopic tilt means that your glasses are not perfectly uh, perpendicular, that they have tilted forward, say vertically, or they've tilted side to side horizontally. So here's an example of something that you might see on a test, but you need to know this clinically. When a hyperope increases the panoscopic tilt of her glasses by raising her temple, what does she induce? So if they're phrasing it that way, it means that this is a vertical tilt, that the top part of the glasses are now a little farther forward away from the eye than the bottom part of the glasses if she's raising her temples. Is that going to give you more sphere, more cylinder? Does it give both? What's the sign of it? She's a hyperope. And the answer is she's getting both cylinder and sphere. Whenever there's panoscopic tilt in any direction, you are inducing sphere and cylinder in the sign of the lens being tilted. In this case, it's a plus lens, she's a hyperope, so plus cylinder and plus sphere. It's important to know the orientation of the cylinder. In other words, where is that cylinder occurring when this happens? And it's whatever direction that she is tilting those glasses that is going to add power there. So if she is tilting the glasses vertically, you're adding vertical power. So what would the axis be if I'm adding vertical power? Well, once again, axis is a label and it's 90 degrees away and has no power whatsoever. So if I'm tilting vertically, adding vertical power, I'm adding cylinder with an axis of 180 because that's where my label would be because the power is vertical. Let me show that to you diagrammatically. So here is a lens with no panoscopic tilt. The black vertical rays are bending just as much as the red horizontals. But if I have forward panoscopic tilt, vertical panoscopic tilt, now my vertical rays are going to converge sooner, more convergence being added here, than the horizontal rays. And you'll see a little note down there that... Uh, Horizontal tilt is technically called face form and only vertical tilt is panoscopic. You don't have to remember that. Call it all panoscopic tilt and everyone will know what you're talking about. Okay, here is uh, some numbers that we've just thrown in here. The degree of sphere and cylinder being added is based upon the degree of tilt. So these are just examples. Um, here you have plus five, and you can see what that becomes. Minus five might become something like this. Here's the last slide I'm going to show you, and I just throw this in for fun. It's a conceptual thing. I've got a plus five, plus one, axis 90. That means that my power is 180, and I'm going to tilt vertically, right? So because it's a plus lens, I'm going to get plus sphere, but I'm going to get plus sill. Notice that the cylinder has been reduced by 0.75. Why is that? Because I'm adding power vertically, but this eye already had power horizontally. So it's neutralizing. Isn't that interesting? There's a lot to learn about lenses, and one thing that will help you clinically is to read about uh, these other things like uh, contact lenses, how to fit a gas permeable lens, why that has to be in minus sill, how to account for the tear film layer, 
and then read a very good section on bifocals such that you understand when to prescribe a flat top versus a round top versus progressive versus uh, executive and you should understand the concept of image jump versus image displacement and that will help your decision making and your ability to discuss these concepts with your patients so all of these things are in clinical optics made easy uh, the book but uh, should be in most optics books that you're reading so do those things and as always work lots of problems so that's all for today next up we're going to have even more fun with lenses if you thought that was possible it is we're going to talk about lens thickness and some other useful things to to help build your armamentarium of understanding of optics so thank you for being with me today i hope you've had fun as as much as you legally could and come back and join me for the next lecture have a great day